And uh, this chapter three is, as he said, it's uh, quite a lot of volume. So we're gonna cover it over two weeks from this week. Next week, probably we'll need one more lecture. So we're gonna cover it over like, three or four lectures in, uh, for this chapter three. Uh, chapter three is about the geophysical uh, exploration methods. So how we can find the hydrocarbons right, from like the unknown area. So the content here is well from the well drilling formation evaluation to the geophysical method and the, the remote sensing. So today we will talk about the well drilling and completion. So it's about the how we drill the well and how we complete the well and how we produce the oil from there. Uh, very brief introduction. Um, so cable to drilling. So I, I think we talked about a little bit in chapter one, <coughs> and people have found the uh, groundwater, and you develop this cable to drilling to uh, find the groundwater and they extract the groundwater, right? Um, so before. Before exploration for oil began, cable to drilling was established a technique in many parts of the world in the quest for water and brine. And brine means that it's a saline water with the salt inside. It could be any kind of mineral. And what they do is that, I can show you. So before, they just do it with by the manpower to drop the, the heavy weight and chip it and then they stub out the uh, uh, chipped rocks so that they can go deeper um, and then after that they use the uh, steam engine or the internal combustion engine for percussion so uh, okay and now cable to drilling they have a also they have an engine with the, uh, the rotational arm and they have a crank so that you can uh, repeatedly apply the percussion to the uh, ground so that they can go deep and they can chip out the uh, rock. Mm. Uh, this video clip shows the, uh, uh, how the cable drill tool works. Lifewater drilling technology introduces the LDT360 cable tool drilling rig. It's affordable, portable, reliable, and with big rig capabilities. Setup begins by leveling the rig with the three 12,000 pound jacks. Once the rig is leveled, the mast is swung outward to its extended position of approximately 30 feet. The mast is then secured with bolts before being raised into the vertical position with the two hydraulic rams. Once the mast reaches its vertical position, it is secured by inserting the locking hitch pin. You are now ready to begin drilling your well by opening the hydraulic fluid control valve to the walking beam, which begins the up and down motion of the drill stem. The cable tension can be adjusted to provide for the appropriate rate of descent of the drill bit depending on the type of geology you are drilling in and keeps the cable from developing too much slack. The drill bit will inch its way through the earth at rates from 1 to 5 feet per hour, depending on the hardness of the rock. That's right, the LDT360 can drill through some of the toughest rock all the way to 400 feet, with bore diameters ranging from as small as 4 inches when using the 600 pound drill stem to as big as 10 inches in combination with the 1200 pound drill stem. That is big rig capability in a small affordable package. 
The LDT360 utilizes parts readily available from third-party suppliers throughout the world making service and maintenance of the rig convenient and an excellent choice for use in developing countries. Another reason the LDT360 is ideal for use throughout the world is that we've made the rig compact enough to fit two complete units in a standard 20-foot shipping container with some assembly required. And the LDT360 is extremely efficient as it's powered with a 14 horsepower engine that requires only about 15 gallons of gasoline to drill the average 100 foot well. At various intervals, water from the onboard 40 gallon storage tank is added to the borehole to enable the cuttings to become a slurry that is bailed out from the hole at two to three foot intervals. By combining modern day hydraulic controls to the cable tool drilling process, the operator gains precise control over all of the functions of drilling, adding safety, convenience, and efficiency to the operation. With cable tool drilling, there is no need for the additional equipment of mud pumps or air compressors for the removal of tailings. And less equipment means fewer breakdowns ideal for developing countries. The bailing process takes place approximately once an hour and is easy with all the controls located conveniently at the work end of the rig. The baler is simply a hollow pipe that fills with the slurry of tailings that get captured with a valve at the pipe's bottom. The valve opens when depressed, releasing the tailings. In some cases, the operator will want to drive casing down the borehole to keep it from caving in. The LDT360 is equipped with a 150 amp arc welder for connecting steel casing. When it's time to remove the casing, the rig packs a powerful 20,000 pounds of lift capacity for the most stubborn casing removal jobs. When the job is done, takedown is as simple as setup. For its cost, no other rig has the capability of the LDT360. For more information, visit us on the web at www.lifewaterdrillingtechnology.com. So this cable to rig was the prime method of the sinking oil wells for some 80 years. And right now, the, uh, for the oil uh, drilling, we don't use it anymore, but still people use it for groundwater. Um, so this is uh, how the bit looks like. It's a chisel shape, and this repeated percussion gradually chips away the rock on the bottom of the hole, and you can see a different shape of the uh, the bit. And and this is called a baler. So you have a, a hollow cylinder with the uh, flapper at the one end. So this flapper just opens it to the one end. So when you push it, it's going to open to this direction. And then when you take out, so it's going to just close it by itself. Right? You have a spring inside. And then this flap valve just opens in one direction, and you can take out the uh, chipped rocks. So and when the cutting has been removed from the borehole, the baler is drawn out and <coughs> emptied. Huh? The bit is put back on the end of the cable and percussion recommences. So it starts the uh, percussion. Um, 
as the hole is gradually deepening, the, the side of, sides have a natural tendency to cave in. So this tendency is counteracted by the lining the hole with steel casing. So as you go deeper, this wall of the hole will collapse by itself because of the, their gravity, right? So you need to have a steel casing to prevent this wall from collapsing. Mm -hmm. And but the major mechanical constraint of cable to drilling is the depth. The drilling depth is limited. Uh, you can drill it up to like one kilometer, but that will be like the uh, normal maximum. It doesn't go beyond that because uh, the cable itself becomes too mm, too heavy. So if you look at, if you think about the mechanism of it, it, you have to lift it and then drop it, right? Lift and drop, lift and drop. And then you need to have a bigger machine as you go deeper, deeper, because the, the cable will get heavier. Um, and uh, it only works in the open hole. So if you have a water or submerged condition, then this percussion power will be weakened right, because of the water, right? So this will work in an open hole without the ground water. So people have so the, uh, the different approach rather than the cable to drilling, and uh, which is called the rotary drilling. So this is the one that we know, that you are drilling with the rotational movement. So now the bit is spinning as you push down. So that's how you uh, drill the hole with this rotary drilling technique. And because of the greater safety and depth penetration of the rotary drilling has largely superseded the cable to method for, the, for deep drilling. And bit is rotated at the end of hollow steel tube called the drill string. And tricon bit consisting of three rotating cones with teeth is commonly used and the teeth chip away the rock and simultaneously use the mud and water circulating in the hole to take out this chipped rock. So I can show you. Does the deep sea drilling vessel Chiku drill into the sea floor? When the vessel arrives at the drilling site, it receives a satellite signal that helps the vessel move into the exact position required. The vessel has six propellers that rotate a full 360 degrees and keep the vessel in one position, preventing it from drifting due to the wind, waves, or sea current. First, the conductor pipe is installed. As the drill pipes are connected, the conductor pipe and guide are run down to the seafloor. After the conductor pipe penetrates the seafloor, the drill pipe is released and pulled back to the vessel. A large drill bit connected to the bottom of the drill pipe is run down to the seafloor. The drill bit is led down to the bottom of the hole through the conductor pipe. The drill bit rotates and drills the sediment and rock below the seabed. Seawater is sprayed from nozzles on the drill bit to raise the cuttings to the sea floor. After drilling several hundred meters, the drill bit is pulled back to the vessel. A casing pipe, about 50 centimeters in diameter, is set into the drilled hole to keep it from collapsing. The casing pipe is run down through the conductor pipe and is inserted into the hole using the drill pipe. Cement is pumped into the space between the hole and the casing pipe to fix the pipe in place. After cementing, the drill pipe is released and pulled back to the vessel. The Chiku is equipped with the riser system in order to drill into the earth even deeper. 
As the riser pipes are added one after another, the blowout preventer is run down to the seafloor. The blowout preventer is connected to a wellhead which is located on top of the casing pipe. The vessel is now connected to the seafloor via the riser pipe. A drill bit, smaller than the one first used, is run down through the riser pipe and casing pipe. The drilling begins. Once the riser pipe has been connected, drilling mud is used instead of seawater. When the target depth is reached, the drill bit is pulled back to the vessel. To drill the hole even deeper, a narrower casing pipe is set in to protect the drilled hole. After the casing pipe has been installed, cement is pumped into the space between the hole and the casing pipe to fix the pipe in place. Again, an even smaller drill bit is run down through the riser pipe and casing pipe, and the drilling continues. Repeating this process, the Chikyu will drill through the ocean crust to collect fresh, live mantle. This is something that has never been done before. Rotary drilling is used for ocean drilling. Let's look at the features of this method. First, the drill pipes are connected one after another as they run down to the seafloor. The work of connecting the drill pipes and drilling the hole are powered by a motor on the derrick. The drill pipe has a drill bit attached to the bottom. With rotary drilling, the drill pipe is rotated and the drill bit at the end crushes sediment and rock to make the hole. After a while, cuttings accumulate at the bottom and drilling cannot go any further. Seawater or other liquid is then pumped from the vessel down through the drill pipe and is jetted out of the nozzles on the drill bit. This liquid current forces the cuttings up to the seafloor. That is rotary drilling. The deep sea drilling vessel Chiku can drill over seven kilometers below the seafloor into the earth. To drill even further below the seafloor, a riser system is used. With the riser system, mud is used instead of seawater. There are several reasons for using mud. First, it has greater viscosity than seawater to force cuttings up from the bottom of a deeper hole. Also, with the increase in pressure at greater depths, the formation pressure becomes much greater than the pressure in the hole filled with seawater. The hole will collapse if a certain differential pressure between the outside and the inside of the hole is reached. Mud has a higher density than water, therefore the pressure inside the hole remains higher, and the hole will not cave in, allowing deeper drilling. The drilling mud is artificially conditioned with various kinds of products, and it is expensive. Discharging it on the seafloor is bad both environmentally and economically. The mud is therefore collected and reused. For this purpose, the riser pipe is connected all the way from the vessel to the seafloor. The drilling mud sprayed out of the drill bit returns to the vessel through the riser pipe together with the cuttings and is collected and recycled at the vessel. Riser drilling not only makes it possible to drill deep into the earth, it is a breakthrough drilling method that is both environmentally and economically sound. 
Riser drilling will make it possible to drill all the way down into the Earth's mantle, a depth never before reached in all of history. So mud circulation and water circulation is very important. And this is the, uh, <coughs> um, this figure shows the onshore rotary drilling system. You have the so four, four main parts are the derrick. So this is the derrick. And you have a blow up preventer and drill column is from here to, to here, this is the drill column, right? And to the, the bit. And you have a rotating system. This is turntable is the rotating system with the engine uh, and the motor circulation system. So through this drill column, you have, you're shooting the mud, mud, muddy water, and it just go up and you're uh, collecting this uh, effluent and also recirculate this water, uh, water and the muddy water. And when we look at the pit, people use the tricontide pit uh, widely, and it looks like this. You have a small gouge insert, right? and this is the uh, cutter cone, and three bits are rotating each other. Uh, so this is another figure showing the, uh, the tricon bit. So you can make this tricon bit with the tungsten carbide uh, steel, stainless steel. Uh, and the circulation of the drilling mud is there are four important role of it. Uh, first is to remove the uh, rock cuttings from the bit. So you shoot out the liquid to remove the rock cuttings from the bit and to prevent the collapse of the borehole wall and to keep the bit cool because as it chips away you have so much friction it increases the temperature and they can decrease the metal right so cooling is very important and to keep the hole safe from the gushing and we'll talk about the gushing soon and gushing is that sometimes you expect the, the formation water pressure will increase hydrostatically, right? At, let's say that you have a reservoir, water reservoir, like one meter deep and two meter deep, maybe 10 meter deep, you have a one atmospheric pressure, right? 100 kilopascal, and it increases proportional to the water density. So and it's gonna be the same <coughs> if you don't anything anomaly in the formation, in the sediment. But at some times, uh, in some location, you have a high pressure zone. So there are some compressed, highly pressurized fluid trapped inside the formation. And if you touch that, it just shoot up. And it's called the gushing. Okay. So, and this gushing is very uh, dangerous for the, uh, the drill well. So you can collapse the well and the collapse the wall and then it can ruin everything. So that's why we use the uh, mud circulation and also we use the blowout preventers and gusher can be the, the last sentence you said gusher can be also prevented by the sealing the well head with a series of valves from the blowout preventer so you've seen that in this last uh, the video clip there was a big tree like material tree like the system with a lot of valves it's called the blow blowout preventer. So these are the blowout preventer. <coughs> and gusher is this. So imagine that this. Uh, uh, brown dark area is the high pressure zone. Then, if you drill, as you drill it, the fluid will gush out. It's gonna be spewing, so that uh, it can re uh, ruin everything. But 
as because the mud is uh, pushing it down so that you can minimize the, uh, the, uh, the hazard, uh, drilling hazard. Okay. Um, so, other assignment is to, just to the view this YouTube clip and uh, review the uh, deep water horizon accident. Do you remember? Do you remember when, when was it? 2000. I think it's 2009. Oh, 2009. 2009 in the Gulf of Mexico, the BP uh, have a had a the oil well <coughs> offshore, and it just and it failed because of the this blowout preventer was not working properly. So that the, there was a huge oil leak, right? You know, oil leak. Christine, do you remember? 2009. I remember, but not the reason. Oh, okay. So they and they investigated the reason of the accident, and the the main uh, reason was the uh, this blow up preventer wasn't working properly. So and this the video clip can tell you more about it, and how also how. The mechanism, the what the mechanism of this blow up preventer. So, um, in the offshore production, you have it's, it costs a lot, and also you need a lot of equipment at the sea floor. And you can see that this here, here, these are the just one well, one well, and one well, and one well. And so, in, in this figure, you can see that there are six wells, and the produced oil is all collected to this manifold and it transport to the uh, somewhere the subsea processing uh, facility and make maybe you can it will be connected to the uh, drill ship or it can be connected to the uh, the production facility or the collecting facility so it's on the water now um, okay so back to the rotary drilling as the bit deepens the hole, the new joints of drill pipe are screwed onto the drill string at the surface. And there's one called the Kelly, a square section steel member connected to the last ends of the steel pipe. And rotary table is the table rotating by the rig motor and that transfer the rotational movement to the bit. And when the bit is worn out, you take out the drill pipe and then you press the bit and lower it down to the bottom again. Crew members make up the Kelly to the swivel stem. The Kelly has either four or six sides and passes through a four or six sided opening in the Kelly drive bushing. The Kelly drive bushing mates with a master bushing. So, when the machinery inside the rotary table rotates the master bushing, the Kelly drive bushing rotates the Kelly and attach drill string and bit. The Kelly is flat-sided with either a square or hexagonal cross-section. It's square in this drawing. It is hollow so that drilling fluid can flow through it. The Kelly moves through a square or hexagonal opening in the Kelly drive bushing. Kelly drive bushing mates with a master bushing in the rotary table. The rotary table turns the master bushing, the Kelly drive bushing, the Kelly, and the attached drill string and bit. The Kelly can move vertically while rotating. The rotary table performs two functions. First, it transmits rotary motion to the master bushing, which drives the Kelly and drill string, and, with assistance from slips, hangs the drill string. The master bushing goes inside an opening in the rotary table. Small master bushings are usually a solid single piece, as shown here. Large master bushings are either split or hinged. Crew members install a two-piece or split insert bowl in a receptacle in the center of the master bushing. The insert bowl is tapered inside and supports the back of the slips. They come in various sizes. The crew changes out the insert bowls to match with the type of slips in use. Insert bowls are also called inserts or bushings. 
Rotary tables have openings that range in diameter from 17 to 49 inches, 43 centimeters to about 1.2 meters. The smallest can hold a non-moving load of 250 tons, about 225 metric tons. The largest can hold a non-moving load of 800 tons, about 725 metric tons. Some small rotaries can spin as fast as 500 revolutions per minute, RPM. Large rotaries spin a bit slower, with upper ranges of about 300 RPM. Manufacturers taper the inside of the insert bowl. They taper it to match the taper of the back of the slips. The slips grip the drill string and suspend it inside the insert bowl. The insert bowl fits inside the rotary table's master bushing. Suspending the drill string in this manner allows crew members to disconnect the Kelly or top drive and break out joints of drill pipe. Crew members can remove the insert bowls to provide a larger opening through the rotary table. If necessary, they can also remove the master bushing. They may have to do this to run a large hole opener bit or large casing. Casing is pipe that the crew runs to line the walls of the hole after they drill it. A rotary table and Kelly system includes a swivel and rotary hose. The swivel has a bale, like the bale or the handle on a bucket, only much larger. The swivel bale hangs from the hook on the traveling block. The swivel allows the attached Kelly and drill string to rotate. At the same time, the rotary hose conducts drilling mud into a curved pipe called the gooseneck. The gooseneck attaches to the swivel and carries drilling fluid to the swivel via the wash pipe. The rotary hose is flexible, steel-reinforced hose that allows the swivel to move up and down within the mast. A passageway inside the swivel stem conducts the high-pressure drilling mud into the Kelly and drill string. Here is an isolated view of the swivel. The bale hangs the swivel from the hook, which is not shown. The rotary hose conducts drilling mud to the gooseneck. Mud flows through the gooseneck, down the wash pipe, and into the stem and drill string below. Wash pipe packing seals the high pressure mud in the wash pipe as the stem rotates. The stem rotates on heavy duty radial bearings and thrust bearings. The main thrust bearings support the entire weight of the drill string as it rotates. Swivels have dead load capacities ranging from 150 to 1,250 tons, about 135 to 1,125 metric tons. An oil reservoir lubricates the bearings and rotating parts. And as I said before, so as you go deeper, you can see the diameter of this steel piping, steel casing, and the drill bit. Uh, casing diameter is the left side number, so 18 inch, 13 inch, like 9 inch, so 18 inch is about how big is it? Uh, multiply by 2.5. So you can drill with the rotor drilling system to the mantle, right? crossing this uh, uh, crust. Um, core barrel is frequently used, sparsely used to collect the rock sample. So during this drilling, you replace this uh, drill bit with this core barrel and you just push it and take out the, uh, the 
the rock cores. Huh? So this is for the coring the uh, rock. And people, like scientists on board, will analyze this core when it's sampled. Huh? It's called a core barrel. Mm. Mud logging is, uh, so during <coughs> drilling, the rate of the penetration, like how fast they drill, like one meter per hour or one meter per day or something like that, and the mud temperature and pore pressure and shell density, gas chromatography is recorded in the loading sheet. So this is an example of the loading sheet. And gas chromatography, people analyze the composition of the gas from the mud because it can tell you whether it has a hydrocarbon inside or not. So if there's a hydrocarbon layer and that the circulating motor mud should contain a some amount of the hydrocarbon. So <coughs> we can tell that uh, we are drilling the, uh, the right position or not. And measurement while drilling and logging while drilling is the technique that people are using currently these days. So during drilling, you can measure the uh, some parameter, physical parameters, like the electrical resistivity and the gamma ray density and the P-wave velocity, and you use it for uh, identify the uh, formation and the lithological information. So here is just uh, one example. You can let zoom up. Company name and well name, okay. and coordinate, uh, elevation, rig type, and check up, so we'll talk about this one. And the log interval the from depth to from 400 feet to the 5,000 feet, right? This is the date, 8, 1981, so this is very old, 20 years ago. And May to, oh, oh this is April, sorry. Right? April 5th to May 21st, and scale, whole size, 25 inches from um, to 750 feet. So you can identify, right? Casing record is 30, 30 inch, right? 30 inch at 40, 400 feet. And mud type, so what you mix, <coughs> right? And this logical symbol, this is for reference for the, uh, the next page. So this is the uh, evaluation log, so this is the actual logging data, and left column shows the rate of penetration, and cutting lithology, and some other parameters, hydrocarbon analysis from the gas chromatography, and here the calcite percentage and the dolomite percentage, and here it shows the lithology. So, hmm, this, this texture, like brick-like this texture is, when we go back, what is it? The limestone, right? So they are drilling the limestone area. And what is it at the upper part? Here is the shale, clay, maybe? Shale or clay? Clay. <coughs> so this is the clay, right? And the bottom is the limestone. So you can read it out, the, what's the Lithological type and what was the rate of penetration and etc. etc. Okay. Question? Yeah. Question? Okay. Um, the on land prefabricated rigs are used. Uh, once a well has been drilled, the derrick is dismantled and moved to the next location, whether the well is productive or barren of the hydrocarbon. In offshore, drill, drilling the derrick can be mounted in various ways. For sheltered inland waterways, it may be leaked on the platform barges and in water depths up to 100 meters, jack-up rigs are used and submersible units are platform mounted on the hollow casing which can be flooded with seawater only stop for shallow water. And drill shape for deeper water, we use the drill shape or semi-submersible units. 
and in shallow water Arctic condition, drill ship, jackups, semi submersible are unusable. So you need to have a different type of the drilling rigs. So <coughs> basically there are four different typical types for the drilling units. <coughs> um, so jackup rig, submersible rig, and drill ship rig, and semi submersible rig. As you go to the right side, it can be used for the deeper water. So jackup rigs are normally used in for the water depths like 100 meters, less than 100 meters, 10 joule meters. Huh? And jackup rigs looks like this. And so these legs can move down to support this structure and at the bottom you have uh, some foundation, offshore foundation which is for the spot can and to have uh, enough bearing capacity mm -hmm. Somerset rigs looks like this and another figure showing the Somerset rigs So important thing about the, uh, this kind of uh, uh, structure is to position. How, because if it floated, then you can move around, right? So you need to fix the position during this uh, production of the oil. And it can be done by propeller. So you can have some propeller like, uh, operating depending on this the type of wave and the direction of the wave. Or you can anchor down with this cable. So, and that's going to be determined depending on the uh, geological situation there or the uh, like oceanographic condition there. <coughs> and various types of production units. Let's see. <coughs> so, once you drill the hole with the casing, you're going to have, have you complete the well for the production. Right? So, completing, completion means that stopping the drill and uh, packaging the well and connect all the valves and connecting to the tube at uh, the pipeline and you can so so that you can produce the hydrocarbon from that well right and that's for the uh, completion of the well and once it completed it will be look like this you have a christmas tree which is a collection of the wells and this to the christmas tree you have a pipeline they can transport the oil to the uh, some central area and at the drill well you have a well cement and casing and you have a produce of pipe inside this casing and packer is installed at some point and this is the tiger reservoir so oil is here then because it's the shale here this is the shale and this is oil and you have a perforated well, so it's kind of a punched uh, steel pipe. And this perforation can be done by shot through, shotting a steel ball through the casing by explosive charges. So again, this is the page one. Um, so this figure shows the uh, surface unit, the, some people call it Christmas tree, we often call it Christmas tree, so it's just, there are many valves, doesn't show you well, but this is one valve, and this should be one other valve, right, and there are pipeline connected to the uh, um, collection facility. And when you start to producing the water, then at first time, because of the high pressure, it just oil flow very well. But as you're producing the long term, the production will decrease. decrease. It declines. <coughs> so, for example, like 100 barrel per hour was the beginning, but two years later or three years later, it's going to be decreased to like 10 barrel per hour, something like that. So then 
you can stimulate the well by opening the fracture. So you can inject some acid water or you can inject some like fluid at the high pumping rate, then you can, in, you can create the fractures and then you can uh, increase the uh, production rate with this kind of a stimulation technique. Uh, and this uh, hydrochronic and other assay technique are used in carbonate reservoir. Mm. In general, the, because of the cap rock, is there, okay, let me, let me go back here. If there is a cap rock and oil is here, and this oil is overpressurized. So if you drill a pipe, I'm sorry, it's very bad writing. And because it's pressurized and you're releasing it, so this oil will shoot out. So you can flow back to the surface by natural pressure. Right? But as you produce more, this will decline, the pressure will decline. Right? So at some point, this oil does not come out by, by yourself, then you install this pump, uh, downhole pump, and pump out the fluid to the surface. So if the reservoir pressure is too low for oil to flow to the surface, the pumping device is used, and it's called nodding donkey. And I think uh, you've seen this kind of uh, equipment in the movie or as you drive in the United States, in Texas, huh? or a downhole pump installation. And people also the, it's referred to as a circle road pump. So you have its nodes, it just uh, moves up and down, and it pumps out the oil when it flows back to the casing. So as oil goes to this direction, and as you go up and down, like upstroke and downstroke, you can pump out the oil when the pressure is not enough. Mm. And diesel or electrically powered beam engine raises a, and lowers a connected string of circle road, which are connected to a piston at the base of the hole. And it's called, this is the circle road pumping. And alternatively, a centrifugal pump may be installed at the bottom of the hole. And this is more effective than the nodding donkey. And less economic, Ecologically shocking. That's, I think that's, that's a joke. And onshore development wells are drilled on various types of geometric arrangement. So this is the example of the geometry arrangement. So here, uh, what is the injector? The triangle is the injector, and circle is produce a well. Okay. So you can Mm, produce the oil from the single well, but it's more economical if you have a multiple wells. So this shows the uh, arrangement of the well and the distance and the type of the arrangement can be done and can be designed optimally depending on the formation, geological formation. And one example is here. So 640 acre section, you have a five spot pattern. So this is the injection well, and this is the production well, right? So one injection well have a five, and a four production well, so one unit is composed of the five spots, right? And this is one mile from one mile. This is an example to give you some idea. So here, the injection well, from the injection well, you inject the water, so you can push out the, uh, the oil to the production well, and then production well will draw out, pump out the, the oil and water mixture. And for the offshore, um, it will be difficult to drill multiple wells, right? So then you have, so people use, drill the multiple well from the one rig. Here, this is the one drilling rig. 
and from there you can drill to different direction so that you have a different wells at the target depth. So then you can arrange the multiple wells even in the offshore. So <coughs> produce it very economically. And this overall um, it's not to scale. So wells up to 10 kilometer in length have been drilled. Okay, whatever. Yep. So this is the uh, just conceptual drawing showing the multiple wells, uh, multiple well arrangement in the offshore. So these are the old wells, right? And this is a manifold that collects the fluid and it can do, uh, send it to the uh, production facility somewhere here. So it's all driven by this one drill ship and it's completed and it will produce it for more than 10 years and 20 years. For the, for the last but not the least, uh, let's wrap up with this video clip. Everywhere you go, in the city or the country, rock beds are beneath you for thousands of feet. Deep in the beds, heat and pressure turn decaying plants and animals into oil and gas. The oil and gas migrate through porous rocks until they're trapped by impermeable rock barriers. Geologists look for the traps. Exploration companies drill wells into them, searching for oil and gas. Before drilling can begin, Division engineers must approve the drilling plans. The plans include the protection of surface and underground environments. During drilling, heavy drilling mud is circulated into the well to control underground pressures. Blowout prevention equipment installed on every wellhead acts as a backup pressure control system. With it, a well can be shut in at any time. Division engineers specify the blowout prevention equipment used on each well. They witness tests to ensure the equipment is in operating order. Good well control training and widespread use of blowout prevention equipment have made California blowouts rare. About 68,000 oil and gas wells were drilled in the state from 1954 through 1980. Only 31 blowouts occurred during this time, with little environmental damage. Drilling oil wells in an urban area is a safe, but sometimes noisy task. Therefore, drilling rigs are especially designed to muffle sound. At more permanent locations, drill sites are built to blend in with other structures in the area. About 26 wells will be drilled from this San Fernando Valley site. 77 wells have been drilled from inside this yellow building in Los Angeles. Derricks on this landscape drilling island in Long Beach Harbor have been mistaken for apartment buildings. Most oil and gas wells are drilled through water zones. Fluids from oil, gas, and water zones must not mix. To prevent this during drilling, heavy mud is pumped into the well bore. These zones are sealed when sections of pipe, called casing, are cemented in the hole. Cement is pumped down the well, through the casing, out beneath it, and back to the surface. To check the cement seal, operators may be required to conduct a water shutoff test witnessed by a division engineer. The casing is perforated through productive oil and gas zones. Depending on reservoir type and pressure, different kinds of production equipment are installed. The amount of oil and gas produced from every well is reported to the division each month. Sometimes, sumps are dug on oil and gas leases. The sumps open depressions holding oil and water can be dangerous to wildlife. Twelve years ago, the division began to locate and classify California oil field sumps. Today, all of the hazardous sumps have been screened or eliminated. Good housekeeping is encouraged at all oil and gas leases. This makes leases more attractive, safer, and environmentally acceptable. Each year, recipients are chosen for a lease award. Dry holes and wells no longer commercially productive 
are abandoned. To abandon a well, cement is placed across all oil zones. Freshwater saltwater contact zones and at the surface. The rest of the well is filled with heavy drilling mud. Before 1915, many California wells were abandoned incorrectly. Today, when these wells are found, they are properly abandoned. Money from a special fund may be used for the work. The Division of Oil and Gas protects California's oil, gas, and geothermal resources. It encourages the wise development of these natural resources through good conservation and engineering practices. <laughs>